His goals are ambitious. I advocate that let's have poor people get energy, 1.3 billion of them who have no electricity at all. He knows this firsthand, growing up in Sierra Leone, studying by candlelight. Now, as Director General of the United Nations Industrial Development Organization, he wants no one on the planet to be left in the dark. An energy revolution. An energy revolution. If we're going to lift 8 billion people by 2025, 2030, you need energy access. Inclusive development, inclusive growth, and general prosperity for all. Outspoken, out to prove there are smarter energy strategies that can benefit all nations. Whether in California, in Singapore, or in uh, London, you can change how you use and generate energy without really significantly sa sacrificing your quality of life. This week on African Voices, the passionate and influential Dr. Kande Yumkela, a world leader on energy. It's been a unique and exciting opportunity. I couldn't find a better job. Kella is a well-known figure in the energy world. He was appointed Director General of the United Nations Industrial Development Organization in 2005. Now in his second and final term, Yamkela is aggressively going after what he believes will help fight poverty and strengthen nations. Universal energy access, electricity for all by the year 2030. He travels the globe encouraging world leaders and other highly influential people to join him to fight and install cleaner, renewable alternatives that enhance energy production that are better for the environment. To say the least, he's been busy. Uh, one of your big topics has been energy access um, to end energy poverty. Talk to me a little about that. Well, we are convinced that without energy, access to energy, you cannot achieve the Millennium Development Goals. I know from my experience growing up in Sierra Leone, going back there today, that if you don't have access to energy, you can't talk about closing the digital divide, getting internet available to people. You cannot talk about getting manufacturing done. Who is going to invest in a, in a country in manufacturing, which they need for jobs, if you don't have a regular energy supply? But we also know that a number of the Millennium Development Goals cannot be achieved if people don't have access to energy. So get clean water, available regularly i'm not saying feel good projects to get it available for a mass population you need an energy source to pump that water to clean that water to recycle the water you need energy in villages to store vaccines so you can do immunization the secretary general calls energy the golden thread that runs through all the development pillars in fact 60 to 70 percent of the greenhouse gases that are causing climate change come from energy systems so if you want to fix climate change, you need an energy revolution. So you're telling me, though, that for all the people out there who don't have electricity, who don't have energy, you're telling me that by 2030, you see it possible to eliminate energy poverty around the world. We believe it's doable. We have the best minds working on this. Wow. Our friends from the United Nations, friends from the World Bank, the International Energy Agency. I feel very excited because we just got a big boost uh, in Rio, uh, support from uh, over 50 developing countries stepped forward wanting to be part of this initiative. The challenge now, we got billions of dollars of pledges, how do you convert pledges to real action on the ground over the next 10 years? Can we hold ourselves and countries and businesses accountable? that what they pledged, they really meant to do. I want you to explain the link, the connection between ending poverty and energy. For me, that's our role in the UN, to make that connection, to see the possibilities for transformative change that spreads prosperity for all. If we don't do it, and we become nine billion, and one third of mankind is still poor, but yet we've taken all their raw materials to be prosperous, there will be insecurity around the world. Do you think people get it? You travel around the world, do people get it? Locally, people get it. 
There's not a single community, not a single country in this world that does not want an energy source. Not a single one. Show me somebody who wants to live in darkness, go to bed at 7 o'clock, as they do in my village and other places, because there is no electricity. The point is, it's the politics of energy. It is related to also access to sup supply sources, the politics of oil and gas, the politics of competitiveness of industries. So simple issues, for example, energy efficiency in manufacturing become very sensitive. And that's why we at UNIDO, my organization, we are helping countries develop production systems that use less energy, use less water, but they still remain competitive. How do you change the old way of doing business? How do you get companies to, to look at new ways? The good news is many companies see today that it is good for their bottom line when they save on energy use or water use. However, the scale we need is not there because governments are still slow to act. We see some mayors acting at the sub-national level, governors acting because they know it's good for the national, for their own local budget. But at the, at the, at the macro level, government level, there is some resistance. Uh, but we see countries, we see China uh, making a lot of efforts. They're leaders in renewables, in many renewable energy technology. We see Brazil, um, they plan uh, already $280 billion in investments in transforming the Brazilian energy infrastructure over the next 20 years. We see the European Union, they have set targets 20, 20, 20 uh, uh, to transform uh, their energy systems. So there is movement, but we need it in all countries around the world. Uh, Dr. Kim Keller, talk to me about the frustrations that you have, uh, specifically when it comes to finance. The frustration, <laughs> The frustration is that um, because of sometimes narrow political interests, you see people knowing what to do, believing in what to do, but for the sake of short-term political gain, because they have to stand for election in four years, they decided they decide not to support a cause. So a short-sightedness? Uh, we call it in global governance short-termism. They have to think about elections in two years or four years. So you are talk, trying to talk to them about transformative change for 10 years, and they're like, okay, yeah, right. But I have elections uh, coming up next year. I need to talk about populist topics now. It's the same with development cooperation. We see, for example, in the context of Africa, people talk a lot about poverty reduction, but they don't want to talk about wealth creation in Africa. But you have to create wealth in Africa. You have to help those economies move into the industrial age. If African population is going to be 1.3 billion by 2030, 2 billion almost by 2050, most of those people living in the cities, you must talk about wealth creation. You must talk about manufacturing to transform those economies. Otherwise, there will be crisis. Where will they find jobs? People forget that this so-called Arab uh, 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 spring revolution started in North Africa. That's Africa. It was about youth demanding jobs. Yes, there was governance issues, but at the end of the day, it was about jobs and prosperity and lack of hope. The rest of sub-Saharan Africa need that change. But people rather talk about poverty alleviation, saving the poor people in Africa, than talking about a true partnership with Africa to transform those economies. That's politics. That's an old paradigm of development in Africa as Africa as a receiver, a poor nation, save their souls. No, it is about partnerships. It's about making Africa a viable entity in a 21st century global economy. That's the issue. Politicians will talk about poverty because it's a little bit more sexy. Yankela's voice is being heard. So far, businesses and governments have pledged more than $50 billion toward the UN's Sustainable Energy for All initiative. His success as a leader comes from first-hand experiences of privilege and poverty. My father made me know who I was, what I am, my own values, and the fact that I, am, I can be anything I want to be. person who knows what it's like to live in large cities you also know what it's like to live in small villages how does that life experience come into the role that you have 
Yes, indeed. I have spent quite over two decades now in, in the first world, as it is called, US and now Europe. Uh, but I have this unique opportunity that I have to go to my own country, my village, Sierra Leone, other poor countries around the world as well. You see on the one hand the reality of the almost one third of mankind that live without electricity, that live, live without basic amenities, that need jobs. But then you also see some of what we need to change in the more advanced world, our consumption patterns, our production systems, the things we take for granted. How do you create that dialogue between the two groups to say, hey, we all deserve a good opportunity in the world? How to do that? Uh, for me, the reality of living in those two worlds has been wonderful, trying to drive that dialogue, as it were. You are a person who, when you were growing up, you studied by candlelight. Talk to me about that. Yes, there were many times. We didn't have power supply in the university, so water cannot be pumped to the dormitories. We didn't have water supply, um, energy supply to keep the lights on, so sometimes we studied with candlelight. But you go to Sierra Leone today in some parts, uh, uh, that still happens, but also in India, in, in, in other developing countries. So for me growing up, I, 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 I have felt that uh, impact of energy poverty. But let me say, in my case and in other cases, it did not dampen our ambition for knowledge, for, for education. We still studied with it, but we wish we didn't have to. We wish we had the same equipment for laboratory uh, experiments as others have. Maybe we would have had more Nobel laureates uh, from our countries. So it is that opportunity, that, that power, energy brings to communities that I am advocating around the world. Yamkela grew up between Freetown, the capital of Sierra Leone, and a small village where his father was chief. It was a privileged life. He was given the opportunity to continue his education in the United States, where he earned his PhD. Being in the United States was great. I saw um, the thing here about the United States is the gong-ho uh, uh, gong culture uh, for encouraging people and giving them the freedom to explore, to do things. I enjoyed that at Cornell, University of Illinois, and Michigan State. I had good faculty and friends and others who really made me achieve my potential. But also in the United States, I was given breaks. Uh, I was given breaks to take responsibility, to be a faculty member at Michigan State, prestigious Ag University. Uh, so I explored my own intellectual abilities and uh, they taught me how to analyze, but also how to lead. Yam Keller returned to Sierra Leone to serve as Minister for Trade, Industry and State Enterprises. His greatest influence in life, he says, was his father. My father made me know who I was what I am, my own values, and the fact that I, am, I can be anything I want to be. He was one of the biggest farmers in the country. He was a chief. He built the roads in the villages, linking our village to the cities, uh, 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 doing his time. All of that he did within two decades. Um, he was a tough guy. He would not let me slack off. And so I, I give him credit for making me competitive for making me believe in myself. And I understand that there have been some hardships, many hardships along your journey, your life. Growing up, I understand that your father was attacked back in 1967. How formative was that on who you've become? Well, my past, my upbringing has influenced what I do today very strongly. I grew up in a political home. Yes, indeed, in 1967, at age eight, uh, we had this unfortunate situation during the second military coup that our home was attacked by people who wanted to eliminate my dad, successful chief, successful politician, successful businessman, who was also advocating at that time for that transition to civilian rule. But for me, because I was held hostage for several hours, now it was a turning point at age eight. Uh, I was angry, uh, but at the same time cool, under pressure. Um, but over time, of course, I have been in all kinds of political movements, leading students' union, in my university, which shaped today my, my, my willingness to take a cause, advocate for it. I don't look for easy causes. Um, I would not have chosen to lead energy issues if I thought it was easy. Eight years as director general, do you find yourself optimistic or uh, more frustrated? I find myself very optimistic because as head of UNIDO, I've had the opportunity to walk into factories 
in developing countries that are innovating. I have seen uh, 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 people committed to that transformation and wealth creation. So I, I remain encouraged that um, there is hope. I see transformations that you would not have thought about 20 years ago. There are countries, Vietnam, Cambodia, China, parts of China that were considered basket cases. I see innovation and transformation in the South that I would not have imagined. So I remain more optimistic that um, politicians, others, will see this opportunity. That in fact these developing countries, with, who are the bottom of the pyramid, can in fact be the new global markets to sustain growth around the world. So I'm more optimistic than frustrated, frankly. When you return, when you go back to Sierra Leone and, and you look around, is there a lot to be done? There's a lot to be done in Sierra Leone and Africa. What worries me the most is the massive urbanization. Africa has one of the highest urbanization rates in the world, meaning people are leaving the villages and packing into cities. Nairobi, Lagos, Addis Ababa, Freetown, packing in there, no jobs, no opportunities. Then they don't have electricity, they don't have services. What type of, what it's, is that? It's a time bomb. Right now, Africa is poised, really poised to lead the 21st century. We have 60% of the world's uncultivated arable land. We have, in, for some minerals, 60, 70% of the deposits in the world. Next, Yamkela returns home. At 81, he was still planning for me. You have to come back, and you will be doing this. I say, Dad, slow down. I'm not here. No, 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 I'm just telling you, when you come back, what you have to do? You have to finish this and do this. Absolutely. How you been? Okay. Pretty good. You look good. All snappy and dressed up. Well, I'm meeting Ready you. Well. <laughs> Very nice. Good to see you, sir. Yeah, good to see you. Come on Bye. in. Come Thank on you. in. Well, they all refuse to die. They always come back. Come Remember back. the line, I'll be back, I'll right? Be back. Exactly. The UN Industrial Development Director General met with actor and former governor of the U.S. state of California, Arnold Schwarzenegger, in Los Angeles. They are energy allies. We have an action plan, what to do in the next 20 years. That's the good part. Right, right. The challenge now is to convert those commitments to real action. The reason I'm visiting Arnold in California, he tried to push energy savings in California without affecting people's lifestyles significantly. He also pushed for alternative energy sources. What is the message? Whether in California, in Singapore, or in uh, London, you can change how you use and generate energy without really significantly sa sacrificing your quality of life. That will help save the planet. But at the same time, I advocate that let's have poor people get energy, 1.3 billion of them who have no electricity at all. Back at home in Sierra Leone, Dr. Yumkela is a big celebrity himself. That's my brother. Uh -huh. <laughs> that's my uncle. <laughs> and that's my chief. <laughs> also my uncle. Electrifying his village in more ways than one. He brings rechargeable lamps, solar panels, and equipment to power hundreds of houses. Another of UNIDO's projects, a hydropower dam. Now along the Benkasoka River, daily life has changed. You're looking at little feel-good projects. I always say to people, we Africans don't want to be basket weavers forever. That's not what my child is looking for. She's in a wonderful university somewhere. She wants to come back to Africa and have a good job. Africans themselves need to think differently today. They must believe that they can transform. Look at what globalization did in the last 20 years, lifting two, three hundred million people out of poverty in India and China alone. If poor countries, particularly in Africa, depend only on commodities, they will remain poor. That is my message, that is my advocacy in the world. And to do that, you need infrastructure, you need energy, good governance, education, market opportunities and global partnerships.
What can the average person do? What can a person do at home to make a difference? Try to change what you can uh, for yourself. For example, use energy different. Second, care about the people around the world or next door. We live in a community. See how you be part of civic society to change how we use raw materials, to reduce how much we waste around your community, around the world. Once in a while, think about how you might touch somebody else, somewhere else. Um, uh, you can do it because of religious reasons, but I'm just saying, do it because, hey, it feels good to help others. Here in this village where I was born, we're trying to do integrated energy solutions. We're starting with an initiative from Dr. Pachauri, the Nobel laureate, that is trying, they call it lighting a billion lives, giving basic solar technology to uh, households. I am at a crossroads. I, I finished my mandate in a year and a half. I, I do have to decide what I'm going to be doing next. There are a number of trajectories that I can follow, um, but of course I'm very homesick. Been in the diaspora for some time. I, I just have this feeling that uh, Sierra Leone is at the point now where we can really make a major break in 10 years. That's the school, there'll be solar panels here hopefully in, in two years when you come. And what's your hope for the future? My hope for the future is rather cautiously optimistic. I, I see opportunity, I see technologies that are there. I am also convinced from what I know that the human mind can innovate, that business as usual will not go on forever. And I, I, I believe that there will be opportunity in the future. I have to be hopeful. And so uh, I am. I've seen quite a lot of change around. In spite of all the doom and gloom, uh, there is innovation out there. People are trying to make a difference. We just need more political, uh, strong political leadership. Dr. Yunkella, thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you for giving me the opportunity. Yeah, 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 yeah.